Welcome to the Songwriters Across Texas podcast. This state has a lot to offer, and music is one of its greatest exports. On this podcast, we get to know songwriters through their stories and hear some of their music. Today, we're at Arlen Studios, and my guest is Gordy Quist from the Band of Heathens. I'm Carl Anderson, and this is the Songwriters Across Texas podcast. His father was a Navy pilot. By the time he was seven, Gordy Quist went from Miramar Beach in California to Virginia Beach to Houston. He enjoyed sports, mainly football, and music was always a great and easy release. He discovered the Beatles and the Stones and Dylan properly, but when he heard Guy Clark, Towns Van Zant, and Steve Earle, he knew what he wanted to do. Still recruited to play football at Dartmouth, how can you refuse? Four years and a degree later, Gordy worked briefly for the Lehman Brothers, and he hated it so much it made him realize he needed to pursue music. He moved to Austin, where newfound musician friends steered him towards a local club, Momo's. Soon there, he found his counterparts for the Band of Heathens. Combining Louisiana Swamp, Texas Country, and heartfelt folks, the Heathens won Best Band of Austin in 2008, pulling in a prestigious ACL live gig and gaining national attention. They're still going strong 17 years after their first release. It's my pleasure to welcome Gordy Quist to the show. Nice to see you, Gordy. Hey man, thanks for having me. Thanks. Don't you have some feelings for a chill run through your bones? Are there any tears for me when you press your eyelids closed? Is there a whisper that you hear when you snap your cold? You're not mine to begin with, you got somewhere to go. Maybe we will meet again When the morning meets the shiver We could go down to the Congress Bridge Watch it fall into the river Whichever path you take Take your sorrow with your laughter You're not mine to begin with You're not mine to go after Chocolate, who's gonna fill your cup? You've run out of reasons, and your boyfriends are all dried send you a postcard when I cross through Lexington I'm done trying to know you and what you say that you're all about you're not mine to begin with you're not mine to figure out when the night starts wandering and you're hiding down in your scar mind to begin with why does goodbye feel so hard you're not mine to begin with it was goodbye from the start awesome man 
I'm so happy you're here, and I'm going to take a second here to, to literally take you in because, man, I haven't seen you in like 10, 12 years. It's been too long. Thanks <laughs> thanks for having me. This this goes way back to uh, the early days of the Heathens when we collaborated on some some uh, film stuff back that's then. That's right. It's good to do this again. That's, that's right. And Ben, you know, I'm going to look literally. Ben's our, uh, you know, the producer and uh, director of this, and Ben and I have been working together for like 15, 17, 18 years. I don't know what it's since he was in high school. And early on, when you guys were getting going, we yeah, we did the thing, and it was really an impetus for us for the whole idea to, to so be cool. here. So yeah. like, what a cr- full cool circle, cool ass full, full circle we got going here. All right, let's get to it. Uh, I want to start. What I like to start from the humble beginnings. You know, early days, and uh, you were a Navy pilot's son, yep. sort of a normal kid that grew up. You ended up in Houston. Yep, outside of Houston in the suburbs. My dad was gone a lot when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and then and then around more when he got out of the Navy and went into the airlines. And uh, and yeah, it's like you know, football is is king. Yeah, in, Houston, in those parts. Hell yeah, it is. And um, and yeah, I kind of grew up uh, doing lots of sports, playing in bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad taught me how to play guitar when I was probably ten years old, and um, so music was always in the house, but. Uh, it was just the, the did, outlet for fun. What know? did they listen to? Uh, you know, it was it was the Beatles and the Stones. I, I remember watching the the Beatles, A Hard Day's Night, uh-huh. for the first time when I was really young, and just being obsessed and memorized, mesmerized by that. Totally, um, me too. But uh, Yellow Submarine too. Oh remember yeah, that? totally. That yeah, was great. yeah. Um, it's it's funny now. Like my kids, my kids know the Beatles as well as anything else too. It's like, oh. it's like generation after generation that music still that's, stands but that's, up. I'm glad to hear that though, yeah. because you know, I don't have my own kids, but I, uh, that the fact that it's just so built into it now that it's like some of the first things yeah. that you play for them. Yeah. It's like the Beatles and, and Willie Nelson, you know, right. It's like, it's like, they know those things, but awesome. Um, but yeah, you know, it, guitar was something that my, a bunch of my pals, we all played. And mm-hmm. when I was 13 started playing in bands um you know grunge music was the thing at the time right so, right uh doing that whole thing but but yeah music's always it was always uh i think what it was originally atten- intended for and that was for a, a release for right. an outlet and um and yeah it was it was there along with sports but you weren't thinking of it in terms of a career it, it wasn't in 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 your house it was just it was celebrated in the same way sports were but you were Everyone in you thought you were going to go into business. Uh, I probably thought I was going to be a pilot at, for okay. a long time. Okay, and that, that uh, makes sense. And then, as football got a little more serious, I started getting recruited from some, some schools in the Northeast, and uh, and ended up going that route. I, I thought I was going to move to Austin and go to UT. That was the plan, and, uh-huh. and get to play in bands and, and do the music thing here. But. Um, Dark myth recruited yeah, you. Yeah, and so I, I kind of had an opportunity to get a great education uh, and keep playing football, which was something. That, it's a, well, not one of those it's sports a, you get to pick back up in your adult years. It's, once it's done, it's right. done. Absolutely, you know? that's right. It's amazing to me when you were telling me, I didn't realize until what you told me last night that you played college football i mean and got recruited to play like that's that's pretty hardcore and that's that's a you know that's not too many people who play football get to do that yeah i mean it was 50 pounds ago and right. a, a totally different linebacker uh, mindset yeah linebacker um you know and it, I, I wasn't good enough to play at ut or any of the, the big schools but it was division one double a it was like yeah. a notch below uh the big schools but um yeah, it, it was intense. You yeah, know? It was a lot of time, huge time commitment, I, and it, frankly, it kind of burned me out on sports. I don't, I don't pay to, pay attention to anything in uh-huh. that world anymore. Unless it's my kids playing soccer, I don't. I'm not really following a whole lot. I, I've, I've recently gotten into the uh, the uh, Austin FC team. Oh yeah, um, I've, I've been really into that. But the football club here is yeah, that's it's, it's great fun. that we have that. It's awesome. It's really fun. Yeah. So. Uh, my wife played soccer in college, so we have like a little bit of a soccer thing in our okay. house now. But um, other than that, um, music kind of as soon as football ended for me, music was kind of the obsession and the passion. Right, and so you, you I think you were you finished you finished up at Dartmouth, and you had a band, and so you st- you kind of stuck around, right? 
Yep. Yeah. I uh, had a band that had been playing together for three or four years there. And, uh, and actually Trevor Nealon, who is currently in the band of Heathens, one of my oldest friends. Right. We met on our recruiting trip to Dartmouth. That we, is such we a trip. We played football together for four years and played in this band together up there. So we did that for a year after school, uh, had a job offer, and I deferred it for a year mm -hmm. and played in this band that broke up a few months later. The band didn't last long. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway. Then, um, didn't yeah. you, didn't, then didn't you go traveling? Like you, yeah, you needed, you needed I, to satisfy it was a weird, something. Yeah, it was a weird thing. I, I had like my, my favorite guitar, this like my only like vintage guitar that I had saved up to buy. And I, it was a weird like cleansing thing of like moving on from that band. I sold the guitar mm. and took that money and bought a plane ticket and a URL pass. And uh, and Trevor and I and another guy, we went to Europe and just backpacked and kind of um, had a great time for two or three months and That's until the so money cool, ran man. out and right. then came back. And, and uh, I, I thought kind of real life was starting and I had this job that mm. I was going to start, so... Um, and yeah. le the Lehman Brothers, that's a, a like a firm, like a, a, ma a money managing firm or something? Yeah, it's an investment bank. It's And it's the one that kind of went bankrupt during the whole meltdown. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. One. The my, I think going to playing in a band after school and then and getting the, the opportunity to travel is something I think that really changed me. Mm -hmm. And seeing how the rest of the world lived um, or parts of the world. And... Uh, and then being, going from that to a super intense like Wall Street job as a financial yeah. analyst, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think had I not done that, my experience might I might have been looking at that job through a different lens. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know, but um, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I just had a, a changed perspective, and I, I think it was really important for me traveling and um, and playing music first, and then I just realized it's, it's not for me. And um, and I did it for a year. I was supposed to do a two year program, but there's a bonus after each year. Right, right. I like so this part I, of the story. Yeah, I was. I remember sitting on my one year uh, day when the bonus money was supposed to hit, and the bonuses were like, you know, as much as your salary. I mean, it was crazy, right. crazy, ridiculous money for a 23 year old, and um, for <laughs> anybody, frankly. <laughs> but um, I was sitting refresh on my bank account, like waiting for this money to hit. And the money hit, and I and I got up and and I <laughs> gave my two weeks, and I moved to Austin after that. That is baller. It's so baller. Yeah. That's well, the... I mean, kind of. I mean, it was it was also like I had a safety net. I had this like money in the bank. Of course. To, like, and it. I, no, I made, it, that's I made right. two solo records with all that money, and then I ran out. You know, and it was sure. like back to like you know. But nothing. almost no one else shows up with money in their yeah, pocket. Yeah. That's so I, I that's was baller. Fortunate, and I had the perspective. It was almost, you know, it was like the hellhound on my trail. Uh -huh. Like not wanting to go back to that world, I was like determined to make it work because I was I did not want to do that ever again. Right, that makes um, total. Which sense. is kind of a weird, you know. I feel like people that have a drive to do something are usually like running from something to not have to go back to. And like what I was running from is this strangely like to some people it would be like the dream job. Right. But um, right, I, I got a taste and it wasn't for me. I use my brother. My I have a brother who's in that that world and. Uh, and he, I'm very close with him. And you know, as an artist, there were times in my life where I was struggling financially quite a bit. Yeah. You know, and uh, he would help me out a little here and there. But he would, do you want to come work for me, man? You'd be great. You know, and I, and I would like, I wish it was that easy. Right. You know, yeah. it would be really nice if that would have if, made if my fun. heart go. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good thing to do yeah. next. I think the contrast, I think this life is full of like contrast and can, like, what do you like? Sometimes you know what you like with, you see something you don't like. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, so you see it, you know, now I'm done with this. Right. And now I'm jumping in. I've got some money in my pocket. I'm in Austin. Yeah. And, and, and made some solo records and then fell into a really great, uh, music community around this club called Momos, yeah, you know, which that's where we go back to. And Paul um, AC. Paul, yeah, I love Paul. He was very instrumental in the early days of the Heathens, and absolutely, kind of really great at uh, cultivating just good community. Yeah, um, that and, was a really wonderful room, always. Yeah, and and I I feel pretty lucky because the the group of guys that first formed the band of Heathens. 
Um, I really felt like it was a little microcosm of the Austin music scene. It was an example of like what can happen and what does happen regularly here in terms of collaboration. Absolutely. It's not about the money. It's about chasing art and, and great live performance and, you know, flying by the seat of your pants, you know, throwing a new song at your band on the fly on stage and totally. like making everybody hang on for dear life just to see what happens because it's Ex fun. Exactly. You know? And the audience is with you. Yeah. And, and they, I, f I feel like that's why the Band of Heathens grew more quickly than any of our solo stuff was growing. Right. It was because we were less precious about it and we took more chances with it. Right. And that makes an sense. And the audience likes to see that. And um, that's one thing I... I, I learned and try to carry with me is is that like you know it's good to be rehearsed and know your stuff but it's yeah. all, like it's also good to be on the edge. Well, you guys also because um, because yeah I knew you all individually you know but when you got together you it, you're generous with each other. That's what was so infectious about it from the audience. You know it was like these guys are they like each other. They like doing this. They're having some fun and it sounds awesome. You know, it was really powerful to, to witness that back then. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think that's uh, one of the things I love about the band. And, and the, the lineup has changed over the years. Um, right. Ed and I are kind of, we've been in it from the beginning. Ed Jurdy, Ed Jurdy. everybody. And yeah. yeah, Ed lives in Asheville, North Carolina now. Right. Uh, I think he's been there maybe 10 years. But, um, but I, I think a mutual respect um, and, and just we've been lucky kind of like finding guys that really wanted to be in the band and right. enjoyed it. And then when they got tired of it, because we toured really heavily for a long time, you know, then people move on and it's there's hard no hard life. feelings. And, and I'm, we're still friends with everybody right. that's been in the band. And, and, and the band is still this, like, really healthy, like, living, breathing thing. We're still writing music and putting out records. And, right. Um, so, yeah, I, you I and feel Ed lucky. never did, he, like you and Ed, as a just that's a really tight, awesome, you know, thing. And you compliment each other in a way that I find, I mean, you, you can go back to Lennon and McCartney. And yet you said the Beatles earlier and your kids just listening right. to them. And so that's a great benchmark to look at. But when I watch performances of y'all, I'm always like, that's this is what's going on here, pretty much. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It, yeah, it's funny how naturally, like, the timbre of our voices kind of naturally go together they're, they're very different from each other his voice is about a third higher than mine which is perfect for stacking right. harmonies like we uh -huh. naturally kind of our, our personalities he's truly like uh my brother in music and um and you know people talk about like sibling harmonies yeah we've been singing together now for 17 years which is like as long as any siblings like growing up that's right you know at this point yeah. we kind of have the the sibling harmony thing just from doing it as long as siblings totally. have. Totally. You know? So it's kind of weird, but uh, but it's fun. Now it's that, still going. That, that is incredible. That I like the way you put that sibling harmony. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Everly Brothers, all that stuff. That's right. I think the Ever and the Everly Brothers were like, that's what I think Paul mm -hmm. McCartney was like, man, that's what we were trying to do, right? Yeah. So this is like the very beginning of rock and roll. Um, hey, let, uh, let's do a second song. Sure. All right. Um, this is one I actually, Ed and I wrote together on a, we were on the West Coast doing some duo acoustic shows. And uh, it's something we came up with over the course of a couple of days. And it kind of uh, normally has the, the super tight harmony thing going. But um, we just put it out as a, a single here with the, the Heathen. So oh, cool. We're going to play it here. It's called Carry Your Love. car was a hell of a ride every turn every curve felt so good in the dashboard light you kissed me for the first time on the first night we got so high the smell that you leave when you sleep and my shirt never washed it once till i heard the news Carry your love all over this town When 
When the summer came and the days grew long We'd spin your records in the evening sun Every word, every song Fireworks flashed and were lost in the dawn You kissed me for the last time On the last night the light was gone the smile that you burn in the back of my mind I can see so clear when I hear your song You broke my heart Everyone you love, you always keep around I carry on love all over this town I carry your love all over this town You broke my Carry your love all over this town. I carry your love all over this town. I carry your love all over this town. I could hear Ed's voice in yeah. my head. Yeah, yeah that's a nice it's one, there. man. Brand new. Let's talk about how when that the heathen, you know, took off and, and you guys you're getting momos and you get and you make live at momos. That's the first yep. one, right? Yeah, we did live at Momo. We actually did two live records before we did a studio record. Right. Live at Antones was yep. the second one, yep. right? That was the one we I think. Yeah, did it was the a D V D and you did the film stuff for it. And uh yeah, it was a live band. I mean, we kind of knew that's where the secret sauce was in right. the band. And um, and then we hooked up with Ray Wiley Hubbard and made our first studio record. Ray Wiley Hubbard introduced us to George Reef, who mixed that record and um, uh, made made a second record with Mark Addison. Um, these are some, you know, Mark and are George are just, like some of the main, yeah. and Ray, of course, is Ray. Yeah. yeah, so you guys are at falling in the right yes. hands. We, we were really fortunate to get hooked up with really great guys and, and started kind of learning how to make records. And um, we did a, a couple of records with George, uh, and he kind of became a mentor and a, a mm -hmm. guide for us. Um, As he was to a lot of folks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for for sure. George was George Reef was such an important part of the the fabric of the whole music community, and and also like you said, there were a lot of people that would have called him a mentor. I think yeah, you know, but yeah. calling him up for lunch and and they're going, "Hey, you just saved me on a therapy bill," you know. Yeah, absolutely. My, my pleasure. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was it about the what, what? How did the band of Heathen sort of get from one? into the S with is it that first record that no, Ray produced no I, you know it's funny um when I when I talk with younger artists now starting out it, it's always the question is like how did how did we get to like supporting ourselves yeah. and like you know, I don't we're not like a huge famous band but we're like a I would say a successful middle class band if we can pay our bills at least and you um, got you know f hundreds of thousands or millions of listeners and certain of yeah. your songs you know like yeah we're we're really fortunate uh and and there was never a hit single or um it's it's kind of like every couple of years something really good would happen that would like bump us up uh -huh. it was it was the Austin Music Awards early on right that was okay that right? good yeah and then that got us into like going to the Americana conference and kind of touring nationally because you could put that on your what was it like at that acl the, that first big the acl taping well, i was watching some of it last yeah, night and i was that, like boy you guys crushed it that was it. 2009 you know it's it's funny like we went from being a local austin band to then kind of trying to tour nationally and then we did the americana 
uh, conference in Nashville, and Terry Lacona was there, who mm-hmm. does the you know the Austin Sea Limits TV show. Right. And we all live in Austin, but he saw us for the first time in Nashville. Oh, at that cool, thing. man. Cool. And that night he saw our set. I think he was. We played after Joe Ely, and I think he was there to see Joe Ely. And he stuck around for our set, and then ended up staying the whole time. And afterwards, he said, "You guys are ready for a taping." Nice. And I was like, "What?" You know, couldn't believe it. I kind of didn't even believe it would actually happen. Like I was really? thinking, "Oh, he's you know he says that now, but like we're gonna call him, and he's never gonna call us back." Uh, you know? uh, but it happened, <laughs> and um, and that was surreal. I mean, that was like the next big thing that kind of notched us up on the national scene. It, it was did, really great. Yeah, but then again, rewatching it last night, it was it it, it also captured the that you know the early part of that yep. band that we were talking about. Yep, yeah, that was kind of the original, the three headed monster Colin. version of the of the band. Originally, there were four lead like singers, Colin. then it went to three. And uh, and it was three singers for a long t- for maybe- oh and Brian yeah Brian and yeah Collins, Brian originally all of your guys' yeah. voices were so nice with each other and uh, and I think that was six years maybe seven years with with that lineup right and then um, just kind of playing two hundred and twenty two hundred and forty shows a year like on the road all the time well and, yeah um, that is a lot yeah and eventually that just it wears you out I would say and also do, how do you keep performing genuinely when you're doing that many I, well it was uh well number one it helped having multiple singers so you wouldn't like okay. blow your voice out because you were get, only doing sense. a third of the of the night singing but then i think you know we had rules in those days no set lists mm-hmm. and we just took turns calling shots on like we would end a song and everyone would look at each other and somebody would spit out the next song and then we would go and so every night cool it was like a challenge to outdo everyone in terms of like doing the song differently than the night before. And like it was, I mean, there were a lot of train wrecks, you know, and some of those shows were terrible because we were so but I've unpolished been... and there'd be like five minutes of silence between songs <laughs> while someone changes guitars. <laughs> but there was also amazing, great nights that were you know that yeah. were incredible because of just the taking the taking chances and for sure. So I think that's how it you know, we were able to keep it interesting for ourselves. But also, but, but back to sports, you know, it's reps, you know, yep. and then, and if you're going to take reps, you're not, you're not going to be perfect. Yeah. If you're going to play 240 yeah. shows in a year and you're taking chances and not writing set lists so you can, you know, all you're doing is sharpening every right. single tool in your tool belt. Yeah. And the, the band was really tight and then it got to a point where it just kind of broke and, it, you mm-hmm. know, three of the five, Three of, the, three of the six guys were just like done with the road within the six uh-huh. month period um half the band left and just like needed a change in life right and um we probably needed space from each other it was just sure. too much the, it's um very and, hard and those to are be lessons on the road like we still quarters like that we're 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 aware of those lessons now like we we now we'd probably do 80 shows a year right you know which is a lot it's for still some bands lot, yeah. but it's healthier uh, for personal lives, for the for our, our health with each other. Yes, um, and it also leaves you time to produce because you you really started getting into producing, and you have. I was so happy when you told me of George Reeves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, George was a, a a mentor and a friend, and when he passed away in 2017, um, he, he was kind of like the problem was like what to do with his gear and his house, and and so. Uh, I was kind of lucked out in, in terms of, you know, no one else was kind of willing to take to keep the studio going. And, uh, and a friend of mine was like, man, we just need to do it, get all of it. And uh, so we yeah, we were able to keep the studio alive. And so we've done in a the lot same space, too. Right. Yeah, so yeah, now you didn't just get the equipment. It's the same. Yeah. And, and it's been um, yeah, it's it's pretty incredible. It's called the finishing school. And um it, George, I feel like George's spirit is alive and well, oh, yeah. and, and all of our creative decisions. There's a picture of George in there, and it's kind of like, all right, would George be scowling at this right now, or would he be digging this? Right. What would George um, do? Yeah. So it's great, and and it's fun to be able to keep like while I'm home, not touring, to be able to be making records all the time, and uh, producing is fun because you get to kind of wear all the hats. You get to do the songwriting, you right. do arranging, you get to play a little bit, you get to sing a little, engineer a little bit. Yeah. So I can um, yeah, I can see that for you for yeah. sure. And uh so we've had uh Madam Radar on the show and uh and they're uh I'm you know big fan of them and they're great, but the first time I saw them I was immediately thought of y'all. 
because of their, you know, the, the way everybody has that great individual talent and voices that worked with each other. Yeah, yeah, they've got the multiple singers, kind of multiple genres. Right, um, and yeah. so it didn't surprise me when I found out you were producing their record. Yeah, they, I connected with them through some of the Black Fret people here in town, and um, yeah, it's it's great. It's fun. Uh, like I said, it's it's fun being removed from being in the band and, and actually kind of uh, Getting. having a different perspective. Well, I mean, producers make records. I mean, they, they, you know, a good producer will take a band and make them crazy. You know, I mean, I'm sure when you guys got Ray Wiley in the beginning, you were like, oh, okay. And then George right behind yeah. it. And you're like, that's nice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I remember Ray, uh, one time we, we'd come back in from, from doing a take and we'd come back into the control room and we'd listen, well, I'll listen to it. And we're like, all right, that was. That was good. Like no one made any mistakes, you know. <laughs> and Ray's just like kind of quiet, and he's like, "Can you guys just go back out there and do it again, and just make it cooler this time?" <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's like, what does that mean? But we all knew exactly what he meant. You know, it, it definitely uh, we knew what he was talking about. You know, it wasn't about not making mistakes; it was about making it cooler. You know. But that was a really good impersonation. Yeah. Of Ray. Yeah. Oh man, I love I love Ray so much. He's he's so wonderful uh, as a songwriter and a person. And yeah. Great. But do you do any other impersonations? I mean, that was no. too good. <laughs> like I was like, you must do others. No, I'm, I'm actually not that good with impersonations. <laughs> <laughs> and you ha so and you it, uh, you have two kid two kids and they're yep. uh, two, daughters. two daughters and yep. they're seven and nine. Yep. And. Uh, Boy, your life has, you know, for me, this full circle of getting to see you today and like, and it's nice for Ben and I too with this from our own, you know, how, how did we get here and what, it, what's, and it's congratulations on everything. Oh Gord. man, thank you. I, I feel so lucky. Um, my, my wife is amazing and she's been supportive. We, we got married like at the same time the heathen started. Yeah. So like our, our relationship my relationship with Ed and her, the timing of it is like the same amount of time, right. essentially. Right. And uh, and yeah, we've just kind of lucked out. She's she's amazing. She she's very successful in in her work, and also has been able to like hold it down when I go on the road. And it's yeah, been a balancing act of you know finding the sweet spot that she can handle at home, exactly. and all the wives in the band. Yeah, and um, and my, my kids are amazing. I, I really wish, like, now's the time in life. I wish I could, like, freeze everything mm. and just live here forever. It's a, it's a good, it's a fun, a fun phase right now. That's so great. Well, can you close us out with one more? Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, all right. Yeah, so uh, we'll go way back in time here. All right. This is the first song uh, Ed and I wrote together. So this, in the early days of the Heathens, everyone just brought in their own songs. There was not any co-writing right. or collaborating other than playing together. Right. And uh, this was the first uh, effort at, uh, at actually writing something together with, with Ed. Cool. Cool. Mama got a voice like sugar, it's so sweet and fine. Sister singing Amazing Grace, she right in time. They're laying poor Papa low in the ground that he worked and sold. Now they're waiting at the Jackson station for the train to roll. She's been up all night, she got them crows walking round her eyes. She can still raise a cup and a toast to a well run dry. Well, he left her on a Tuesday still, gin, whiskey, and a bottle of pill. Waiting at the Jackson station, looking over the hill. Take me away, he 
the whistle play a sad, sad song Lay me down where the river runs wide and strong Sometimes she rides a ticket home Other times she'll leave you all alone just a-waiting at the Jackson Station for the train to go. gentlemen a killer <laughs> that was so good thanks so much again for yeah, being cool. here if y'all been watching this on the cw and you want to see more go to the songwriters across texas youtube channel and there's a full length version of this what you just saw and also bandaheathens.com don't forget gordy thanks yeah. again thanks carl thanks for having me All right.